Welcome, everyone. I'd like to thank all of the partners who made this event tonight possible. Fells, under the leadership of Dr. Nelson Lim and Dr. John McDonald, Women of Fells, and Young Involved Philadelphia, an organization of approximately 7,000 members whose mission is to make Philadelphia the premier city for the next generation of leaders by engaging, connecting, and representing the young population through a variety of programs. This event, this event is being hosted as part of the FELS Public Policy and Practice Series. The series is divined, designed to provide students with a variety of perspectives and compelling personal narratives that will help them not only form their own opinions on important policy issues, but also help shape their careers. This series is offered in conjunction with the FELS Graduate Public Management course required of all FELS MPA and Executive MPA students. Fells is very proud to offer these important conversations to the entire Penn community and to members of the public. Our panel tonight will be moderated by Elizabeth Vale. Elizabeth is a senior fellow here at Fells and a wonderful advisor and resource for women of Fells. Elizabeth previously served as senior advisor for Elizabeth Warren's Senate campaign. She also served as the director of the Division of External Affairs at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And before that, she served as the White House Business Liaison and Executive Director of the White House Business Council under President Obama. Elizabeth will moderate a discussion tonight with Cecilia Munoz, who is currently the Vice President of Policy and Technology and the Director of the National <coughs> Network at New America, a think tank and civic enterprise committed to renewing American politics, prosperity, and purpose in the digital age. Prior to joining New America in 2017, Cecilia served on President Obama's senior staff, first as Director of, Inter of Intergovernmental Affairs, and then as Director of the Domestic Policy Council. Cecilia received a MacArthur Fellowship in 2000 for her work on immigration and civil rights, and has served on the boards of the National Immigration Forum, the Open Society Institute, and the Atlantic Philanthropies. We are so grateful that Cecilia is able to join us tonight for what will surely be a robust discussion. And with that, I'll hand it over to Elizabeth to begin the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meg, and thank you all for being here. I'm so impressed. There are over 150 of you on a Friday night at Penn, so well done you. Amazing. It had nothing to do with the free alcohol, I, I know. But, um, <laughs> No, I know exactly why you're here, and it is Cecilia, who is a one, once-in-a-lifetime person, and I am just overjoyed to be able to share her with you, my dear, dear friend from our White House days. So thank you all for being here. Uh, the good news is you get to ask a whole bunch of questions tonight. So I'm going to start off, but when I look at you for questions, I don't want anybody looking down, because this is really a tremendous opportunity for, for you all as well. So let me spend about half an hour on mine, and then, then it's your turn. Um, I just want to add to that great Meg Pierce introduction and say that Cecilia is one of the very, very, very few people who spent eight years in the Obama White House, uh, besides him. I mean, uh, there are maybe some, <laughs> well, <laughs> that counts. I mean, particularly at her level. Cecilia um, and I were there together, but she, she has one of the most senior positions um, and was there for all eight years. So I, I did two, nearly killed me outright. The average tenure in the White House is 18 months, so to have someone here at your level who survived eight years and you still look about 35. That's why I look so tired. Amazing, <laughs> amazing public service. And actually, as I was, um, last night as I was looking up what she did, so she had, it, among other things, the Domestic Policy Council for five years. I knew kind of what that was. It was a big deal, but I was in a different lane, so I looked it up yesterday. It was established in 1985 by President Ronald Reagan. And it oversees, ready, the development and implementation of the president's domestic policy agenda. Yeah, all of it. Um, and ensures the coordination and communication among the heads of relevant federal offices and agencies. I asked Cecilia what that meant. That meant she oversaw policy in health, education, labor, energy, the parts of the economic policy that the, economic, the National Economic Council didn't want, <laughs> like poverty, you know. Anyway, so astounding, astounding background. And before that, um, when I was actually there with her, she headed um, Intergovernmental Affairs, which was all of outreach to mayors and governors um, across the country. So just phenomenal that you were there eight years and did such public service. So, so thank you. And also five chiefs of staff, by the way. Five chiefs of staff. She survived. Yeah. 
Anyway, there's um, some stories there. <laughs> there's stories there too. So let me start off and talk a little bit about um, your background. Actually, um, you were asked by President Obama also uh, in your spare time to oversee our immigration policy. And your family uh, were immigrants yep. from Bolivia. Yep. And I wonder how you ended up you know, getting to Michigan, the University of Michigan, and how that all happened for them. Um, so hi, thank you all for coming. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth, for inviting me. Um, it's lovely, it's amazing, actually, that so many of you are here, so thank you. Um, so yeah, I'm the daughter of immigrants. My parents are from Bolivia. Um, my dad came to the US to study, and he, he has a degree from the University of Michigan. His father actually studied at the University of Michigan and came back to Bolivia and built the only house in La Paz with a front porch um, because of Michigan. And he sent all of his sons, not his daughters, but his sons, one of whom was my dad. Um, and he got an engineering degree, went back to Bolivia, married my mom, and then confessed that he hadn't graduated and hadn't, he needed one more credit. <laughs> so they came so they could get that last credit, and they ended up staying. So I'm a, I'm a Michigan girl. I, mm -hmm. I was born and raised there. But the notion that you could you know come from an, I have one of those big, messy, wonderful immigrant families because other relatives came um, after mm -hmm. my parents, mm -hmm. and it was this real source of pride. My mom didn't live to see me arrive at the White House, although mm -hmm. she did live to see the president um, win Iowa, which wow. kind of blew our minds. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but it's a great source of pride yeah. for my dad that you could come from a c country as, as where mm -hmm. things are difficult as they were in Bolivia when they were growing up and mm -hmm. have your child serve the president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Big That's deal. Fabulous. So you also have a very non-traditional career uh, or <laughs> non-traditional training for where you ended up. Um, which is very inspiring to those of us who have no idea where we're going still, you know. Um, <laughs> and I know you were an English major yep. uh, at Michigan. So Any English majors out there? English majors, Thank you. yay. Um, you, can, you can be gainfully employed. <laughs> yeah, if you're lucky. So, yeah, so you're an English major. You do not have a public policy degree. Oh, sorry. You do not have a law degree. Oh. And how, and, and you ended up in public policy. How did this happen? So how, how did you have such a non-traditional career? So um, I followed, I did stuff that I loved. So I don't have, I, I feel like I have to apologize, especially when I'm at a public policy school, because I don't have a policy degree. Turns out not to be a necessity for making policy, although it's really useful. You're not wasting your time. Um, um, but I, so I studied stuff that I loved, but I also worked as a volunteer. And when I was in graduate school, I volunteered for a really small church run legal services organization that was providing services to immigrants. And I've kind of been doing immigration ever since, actually, up, up until now. So I, um, I was one of those people who was very sure of what I wanted to do. I was sure that I was going to work at a, like a direct service organization, like a place that had clients in need of social services. And so I was lucky enough to find a job doing that in Chicago after I left graduate school and discovered that I'm actually not very good at it, um, that I couldn't let go of the people that we had to say no to. I, I really agonized about that. But I also discovered that the clients that we were serving um, needed, had advocacy needs, and that I was good at that. And I ended up at um, an organization called the National Council of La Raza, where Deirdre Martinez, if she's still here, also worked. We were colleagues. There you are. It's now called Unidos US. And um, I developed my expertise by doing work in, in my community. Um, and, that, and I found an organization that valued that. Mm -hmm. And so I got to know public policy from, by doing, mm -hmm. and then um, got a lot of training in the years that I was at NCLR. So I, mm -hmm. while I'm in uh, my policy expertise, my deepest expertise is in immigration policy, I learned a ton about education and health care and all of the same issues that I mm -hmm. ended up working on when I was mm -hmm. at the White House. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the story really is I, I got to know then Senator Obama when he came to the Senate. There, we were trying to pass the same immigration bill we're still trying to pass. Um, and so he would call in experts to brief him, and so I was one of those, so I met him sort of around his conference table in his Senate office. But he was one of those senators who, if he had questions after the briefing, he would just call you up and ask questions. So, so I knew him a little, not a ton, but enough to know that he was somebody that I would support when he ran. But I, like, I helped the campaign, but, but like we worked with people who dropped everything and lived in their cars in Iowa in mm -hmm. December. Like I, I wasn't one of those. Um, but to my astonishment, when 
after he won, I got a call um, to interview for the intergovernmental affairs job. I didn't actually want to work in government. I was very happy and challenged at NCLR. I have, I'm married. I had, at the time, two teenage daughters. My mother had recently passed, and I, I was really focused on the mom thing. Um, so, but I went for the interview because I wanted to know what Rahm Emanuel was thinking about immigration, actually. Oh, that's why. That's why I went. So it was great. It was like a low-stakes interview because I didn't want the job. Um, but I could get in intel on what they were thinking. And uh, they, the, the, Jim Messina, who was, became the deputy chief of staff, called me the next day because I was really honest with them that like, I wasn't actually angling to work in the administration, that I wanted to focus on my kids. And he called me the next day and said, we have really bad news for you. We want you to take this job. <laughs> and I said, no. Who had you interviewed with? Ram and Jim. OK. Uh, and I said, thank you so much. I'm really honored. I got these teenage girls. I don't want to turn their lives upside down, so thank you so much. If you want to call me in his second term, I'll come, because they'll be grown. So I said no. And then the next day, I'm doing carpool duty with my youngest daughter. My cell phone rings, and it's a 312 number, and I think, oh, this is not going to be good. And it's Rom saying, we're going to try to be family friendly. We really want you to do this. I want you at the table on immigration. And then he says, can you hang on for a minute? And the next words I hear are, this is Barack Obama. <laughs> Uh, and, he, and he twisted my arm. He is, as it turns out, he is shameless about doing things like that. I discovered after. Thank God. Thank God, too. And it's kind of hard to say no after that. So, so to my astonishment, I went, went into government. I never dreamed in a million years I would do it. And I, there's a part of me that still can't believe I did it. Thank and God I did you did. Years. Thank God you did. Well, thank, thank you. you for that. That's, Amazing. Well, that's a great story. You have to write a book, dear. Um, <laughs> So you're also a certifiable genius, I, I gather. Um, what, what is that like? Um, you <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine myself, but uh, I gather, yeah, so the MacArthur Fellowships are awarded for exceptionally creative people, and they are geniuses. So ha how has that changed your life, to be a genius? It's is that pressure? And, you know. Well, it's right, it's part of, it becomes part of your introduction everywhere you go, and then you feel like you have to say something really smart. So um, it's, you know, the, it's a secret process, so you don't apply for it. You don't know that you're being considered. And then they call you one day and say, can you keep a secret for a couple weeks? We're going to give you this crazy award. Um, and, and then they do a big, splashy announcement. There was just an announcement this last week. And there, it's a, this current class of dreamers, or of, of MacArthur's, is amazing, including uh, Cristina Jimenez, who runs United We Dream, wow. which is just great for her and for the movement, and it's super exciting. Awesome. So it, it elevates you really quickly. You're suddenly in the paper and associated with this thing. And what was really interesting is that, um, so this happened in 2000. Uh, I was working at NCLR. And right, so NCLR is now Unidos US. I haven't gotten used to the new name yet. Um, is a policy and advocacy organization, a think tank. I had a lot of expertise in immigration and civil rights and education and health and other things. Um, but that expertise is only valued in certain places and not necessarily in others. And when you work for um, an organization with a constituency like that, the interesting thing is people assume you're biased. That if it's a, a non-Latino organization talking about immigration or education, the assumption is that they're neutral and that we're not neutral. Um, and getting the MacArthur changed the way I was heard oh. and where I got invited to speak. So all of a sudden, to be honest, I say this knowing that I'm in a university setting, mm -hmm. which I greatly appreciate. I was invited to university settings after the MacArthur and it was sort of thought mm -hmm. to be credible in a way that I wouldn't have been thought to be mm -hmm. credible before. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. And it made me think, all right, this means this foundation has for some inexplicable reason decided that my voice means something so I better make it mean something, like you, right? You, so oh, I've, tr I've tried to, I thought a lot about, like, what is the meaning of this thing? Mm -hmm. um, and I tried to make it about something yeah. and make, make sure that if I was going to be yeah. heard in places that wouldn't have heard me yeah, before, that I it. made it count. Don't waste it. I mean, in a way, that's, that's pen for all of you, too. I have to tell you, it's a hell of a credential, and don't waste it. Don't waste it. A lot of people would love to be here. There, I'm being your mother. I know. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's the same sort of thing, though. You've got a hell of a credential, and, and use it. So um, 
So you were in amazing places heading, you know, IGA, government, intergovernmental affairs, uh, overseeing immigration policy, overseeing all domestic policy. Yeah. What was it like to be a person of color in those roles? Um, so in the Obama White House, it was an amazing experience because sort of by definition, a lot of people around the table who are people who recognize that it's important to have diverse voices around the table. I was frequently, because I was on the senior staff, which is not a very big group, uh, I was frequently the only Latino and always the only Latina. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, you, yeah, you think about that too, right? It carries some, I, I had a sense of responsibility mm -hmm. about that. And, um, but there were always safe places to go when I was struggling with something, one of those safe places, as you know well, was Valerie Jarrett's office. Mm -hmm. um, she was my boss when I was the Intergovernmental Affairs Director, and then you know my colleague and friend the, the whole eight years. Uh, and there were times when, well, early on, there was a time when, and I knew exactly when it was happening, when people are assessing, and these are really good, committed, wonderful people. We worked with amazing people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but there was the moment when there was some critical decision where I was sitting at the table for, and you could tell people's radar was going for, all right, is she going to be, is she wearing her advocacy hat, or is she wearing her, I'm going to say what, what's good and recommend what's good for the enterprise hat, because they, sometimes they overlap and sometimes they don't. That's just true the way it is. And I, I felt like it was important to say, here's what you're going to hear from the advocacy community, you need to understand this, and here's what I think is the best decision for the enterprise. Sometimes they were the same, sometimes they weren't. But it was, I could tell it was also going to determine whether I was going to be in the room or at the table for other things. Um, you can't just wear your advocacy hat. Mm -hmm. um, but there's times when you have to, when people don't want to hear it, mm -hmm. and it's really hard to know the difference, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes I would take those things to Valerie to say, and, and the, the hardest times for me were times when there was stuff I felt like the people in the room needed to understand, that I, stuff that I knew that they didn't know, mm -hmm. um, but I couldn't figure out a way to articulate it and, make, and be heard and understood. Mm -hmm. And there was one time where it took me a couple weeks to figure out a way to formulate it so that people got it. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you know, it's possible to reach that point where people's eyes mm -hmm. glaze over. Like when the minute you start talking, they know, oh yeah, she's gonna go there and we're, we're, you know, mm -hmm. we'll be polite. Um, so I felt responsible for making sure people understood stuff that they didn't come to the table understanding. Mm -hmm. um, but it, that was in the context of it being an mm -hmm. environment that was, you know, welcoming and yeah. where people got that there was a reason I was there. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, mm -hmm. and I drew on this a lot, mm -hmm. he asked me to come on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Like he missed, the president knew who I was. He knew I was an advocate. He asked, he, that was what he asked me to bring into the room. Mm -hmm. So whenever I had doubts or questions about it, I would remember that, and I leaned on that very hard. Like, mm -hmm. this is what he actually needs me, from me right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, you, you can draw a lot of courage from that. Mm -hmm. And I did. Well, well, and you know that expression, those on top of the mountain do not fall there. You have a very unusual EQ and IQ blend that is priceless. Thank you. So I'm gl glad he identified it, and I'm so glad you were there. So. Um, Interesting question I always get from young people, not just young women, but young people, is how do you, how does one do it all? And mm -hmm. you appear to have done it all. You have a very lovely family. You have wonderful daughters. You have an intact long-term marriage. And you, had a, you have a career, and you're young still, before you and behind you, a career that's just remarkable. How did you do it all? I mean, because mm -hmm. you went into the White House when you had teenage daughters, which is a nightmare at the, at the best of times. <laughs> so so what, what's your recipe? So, I, I'm not sure I believe in having it all or in, a, in a, applying that. Well, and you work for Anne Marie Slaughter right I now. I work for Anne Marie Slaughter, so right. Right. Slaughter. Who yeah. was great and lovely to work with. So, I, my kids were my priority, of course, and I said no to a lot of stuff, um, to be honest. Uh, and I don't regret any of that. So, I was at NCLR for 20 years. In those years, I got married and had, had my kids, and I was, as I just told you, content to stay because I was challenged. But it was also hard work, but flexible. Um, in fact, I worked from home. But around the time my kids got to be tweens, I negotiated a, a way to work from home every Friday, 
which just took us like back from the edge a couple of notches because it's when you're working and there's kid logistics that so can get pretty close to the edge. But several things are true which have been vital for me. One is that I'm married really well. I married a really good guy. Pen guy, pen guy. Pen guy. Pen grad. Two, two graduate pen degrees grad. from here. Yeah, pen grad. Um, and he, he, I'm fortunate to be married to someone who doesn't think there's like mom jobs and dad jobs aside from the birthing and the nursing. We all kind of did this, we did the same thing. And, uh, and so we really shared the responsibility in a way that really felt equal, which mm -hmm. was amazing. And then, except it wasn't equal, when I went to the White House, he took over all, everything, air traffic control, with, which there's a lot of with teenagers, um, and gave me the space to, to do the, what I did during those eight years. And I can name exactly what I did. I worked, I had family time, I exercised, ate, and slept. That, like everything else was jettisoned. Um, and uh, he, my husband made that possible. Mm -hmm. So fi having a good partner is important. Knowing what's most important is important. Um, so in the years I was at NCLR, and Deirdre can probably attest to this, because you were there when, I, when my kids were little, I, I, um, my standard for like what evening events were important enough that I wouldn't see my children that day was really high. And I just, I said no to a lot of stuff mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I wanted to be around. Mm -hmm. And it appears not to have hurt my career. And, yeah. and I, I didn't actually even worry about that that much because who has time to worry about that? Mm -hmm. I was doing work that I loved and focusing mm -hmm. on my kids mm -hmm. and that was plenty. Fantastic. Well, and you got in a space you were equal to. I said that to you before. You're equal to that space, which is, says a lot about you. But I did. I said no to some fairly yeah. sexy jobs, including working in the Clinton administration. Really? I don't regret saying no. So at he all. didn't phone you on the phone, I guess, huh? No, he yeah. didn't. I didn't get my arm twisted. Yeah. Um, yeah and my kids were really little. Yeah. And uh, I, it's it's okay to say no to stuff. Mm -hmm. Men and women, it's mm -hmm. okay to say no to stuff. Both my husband and I did, yeah. and we don't really. And hire help. Always hire help. <laughs> or be willing to like have a messy house and a terrible garden. Yeah. And <laughs> not go to anything else. Exactly. Which I have all of those things. That's fantastic advice. Um, so fast forward a little bit in the White House. Um, I gather Stephen Miller, Stephen Miller is now in your office. Occupies your office now. Did you leave like any bugs is behind or anything? Um, yeah, no. <laughs> and 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 uh, B, what what was it like uh, to be there when yeah. now President Trump won the election? You were in the White House for another, you know, yeah, couple of months. Yeah, right. The election was in November. We were there till Jim. Our last day was January yeah. 19th. So um, three, almost three months. Yeah. So I can't. I'm, I. It bothers me a little bit that Stephen Miller sits where I used to sit. I realize it's not my office. It's a. It's it's in the White House. Um, but the previous two occupants were women of color. Um, and this is a guy who reportedly, like unfriended in the, before there was Facebook, his Latino teenage friend because he was Latino. So mm. I, I struggle with that a little bit. Um, the, look, the election was a little painful um, at, for lots of us. And we were as shocked by the result as the rest of the country was. So the story I can tell about that, I'll tell two stories. One is that the, the senior staff has a meeting every morning in the chief of staff's office. And, but, and we are people who check our email all the time, day and night. So we got an email at about midnight on election night from Dennis McDonough, who is the chief of staff, um, saying, everybody hop on the phone in five minutes. So we all hopped on the phone. And he said, look, we're all watching the same thing. We all know where this is going. I need you to go to sleep because we have to start the transition tomorrow. And I can't do it with exhausted people. So go to bed. We'll deal with this in the morning. Um, and, you know, we got there the next morning with everybody shell-shocked, uh, you know, in the way you would expect. And Dennis clearly hadn't taken his own advice. I don't think he had slept. But he had a set of talking points for us on paper. Like, he, he had done the thinking for us because he knew we were a mess. And this is leadership, right? And uh, he basically said, I need all of you to convene your teams because you know how everybody's feeling. I know you don't know what to say, so here's something that you can say. But we've got to get through this together. And we are, like, we work in this building at this moment, and one of the most sacred traditions in our democracy is a peaceful transition. And 
we benefited from a really professional job that the George W. Bush administration did, and we're going to do the same thing because that's what the country needs from us. So he did the thinking for us and, you know, helped us get, get our teams through that day. And then the, the other story I'll tell about that is that the, the president was really, he was kind of like grief counselor in chief. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was obviously not happy about the result either. <clears throat> But he kind of went around the building, and there's gatherings of staff that he would that that he ended up speaking to, and he said a couple of things. One was, um, you know, I he would say, I believe that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice. But what made you think it was going to be a straight line? It's not a straight line. Never has been. We have these ebbs and flows. History is like that. What you do in this moment really matters. And then he would say, uh, remember the Bush reelect, right? The, the election in 2004, we had expected a different outcome. It felt pretty terrible. Uh, only two Democrats were elected to the Senate that year, Ken Salazar and Barack Obama. And he said, so that's what getting to Washington felt like in 2005. And just remember that four years later, I was elected president of the United States. Like, these are twists and turns of history. But what you do in the ebb moments determines where you're going to get. So I understand your grief, but I need you to focus because uh, we have work to do for, you know, for the country, not just in our time in the White House, but like, uh, you know, we, we, we're still the, and I believe this down to my bones, this is still the same country that elected Barack Obama twice. But it is also the same country that had Jim Crow laws and, you know, internment camps. And, like, we're that country, too. We always have been. And so our job is to, is to do what we're capable of, mm -hmm. right? We know what we're capable of. Mm -hmm. We've done it. Mm -hmm. We know the best that we're capable of, and we can, mm -hmm. you can't stop pressing for that. Mm -hmm. So nobody was more vigorous in reminding us of that than the president mm -hmm. himself. Wonderful. Well, and you have a room full here of, of leaders who are, who are coming along, and uh, they are incredibly thank inspiring. Thank goodness. So, yeah, thank God. Thank God. No pressure. Okay, guys. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's very inspiring. Thank you for telling those stories. Wow, that's quite a moment you lived through there. Um, so let, let's switch gears a little bit. You've been very, very involved in, um, in what has become DACA. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to step back a bit, and this is from my own ignorance, really. Can you explain to us what yeah. DACA is, what the problem was, is, and what the solution was aim, aiming for there? Yeah. And, and so in general, folks know who dreamers are, which that, right? In general, yes. This is amazing because that hasn't always been true. Um, and I never go to a place where I have to explain who dreamers are anymore, which is amazing. Um, and that is because dreamers have been so brave in telling their own stories. Um, DACA, and this is actually legally really important, is not a program. It's an exercise in enforcement authority, right? So this is the, the, the DHS, the enforcement authority, is basically saying there are 11 million people here without immigration papers. It's a lot of people. And even though Congress gives DHS a lot of money to enforce the law against people who are deportable, um, we're not, they're, we're not going to deport 11 million people, so we have to make choices. There have to be priorities. And so what the Obama administration said was people who have you know, criminal convictions are going to be higher priorities, but there are people who are lower priorities, and we're going to name some of those characteristics as well. And a DACA is essentially an expression of that. So, um, but what DACA recipients are doing... What's the acronym? Uh, deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. The deferred action part re refers to deferring action on their deportation, right? So these are people with the courage to stand up and say, I am here, I'm deportable, I am asking you to defer acting on my deportation and to give me the ability to work legally in the United States because you're acknowledging that I'm not going anywhere. That's what DACA is. And it was really important to us to be clear about what it was as people were applying, So, because it took some courage for people to do that. And we had no idea the extent to which people would come forward, because it's a fairly scary thing for reasons that we now know all too well. Um, and we kicked the tires really hard on the on 
whether the agency would be able to implement it successfully before we made this announcement. But it's an exercise in enforcement authority. It's renewable every two years, and the reason for that is, again, legally we, had, we knew we were going to get sued, and we knew we were going to have to be able to show that this wasn't permanent, that, um, that it was, these were individual decisions. We weren't granting people something as a class. So we kicked the tires very hard on what our legal authorities were, but it is a very aggressive use of enforcement authority, using a tool that's been used by lots of administrations before, but using it in a much more assertive way. Um, and those were, those were hard decisions. Um, and the, you know, the results in people's lives and for the country has, has mm -hmm. been extraordinary, mm -hmm. really extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And look, it's been unthinkable for DACA to be revoked mm -hmm. for five years. Uh, and here we are. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what happens next? Where do we go? What's your crystal ball? The honest answer is I don't know for sure, but I do know that we have a chance to get the DREAM Act passed that we, we cannot let slip through our fingers. Mm -hmm. And if anybody would have told me a year ago that I would say the words, we have a chance to get the DREAM Act passed by Christmas, mm -hmm. I would have thought you were out of your minds. Mm -hmm. But the fact is that we do. Um, and so... The challenge is, the, the, the reason we have that opportunity is because the president has done this unthinkable thing and created a deadline that he didn't need to create, um, that if Congress doesn't act, 800,000 people and their families and their communities and their workplaces will all be harmed. Um, so he's created a crisis. We know there's bipartisan support for the DREAM Act. We know actually lots of Republicans who desperately believe that it, it, that it would be terrible for this, you know, this bad thing to happen and to have their fingerprints on it. And there is must-pass legislation which has to happen by the end of the year to keep the government funded and on the debt limit. So that's, those are the ingredients which create the possibility hmm. um, of, of legislative relief. But I will say that I have never seen, um, in, I've been working on immigration policy for 30, more than 30 years. I've never seen immigration legislation that has any element of generosity towards anybody that doesn't also have other stuff. Um, I, I suspect that other stuff is likely to be border enforcement, which is different than enforcement in the interior. Democrats vote for increases in border enforcement every year and have forever. More for, you know, much more than we need, but this is never a conversation about what we need. So there will be some other element, mm -hmm. um, and the question is, what is that going to be? The Trump administration, Stephen Miller, in fact, has put forward a crazy set of conditions which are completely unacceptable, but that's because this is a guy who doesn't want his boss to cut a deal on the dream. Mm -hmm. he, he would like to deport these people. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's, a, it's not easy, but, mm -hmm. but we have an opportunity to get it done, mm -hmm. um, and so that's kind of where the focus is. Mm. Well, that's uh, that's hopeful. Sort yeah. of, right? Sort of. A little, yeah. a little too scary. Today, every day is different. Yeah. So, a um, little bit happier question. Um, I mean, this is the last question from me. So, I hope you're all ready out there. Yeah, with your questions. Um, you have a very cool new job uh, with I New do. America I do. Foundation, and I'd love to hear about it. it it's in IT um, for nonprofits. But tell us about New America, and tell us about your new role. So um, New America is started life as a think tank about almost 20 years ago. It is now run by a woman named Anne Marie Slaughter, who worked in the State Department um, in the Obama administration, and was is also was the dean of the Wilson School at Princeton. Um, and her theory, she's a network theorist among many, many, many other talents. And her theory is that um, a think tank, which is kind of a Washington-centric institution. Right, you invite policy experts and policymakers and develop ideas, and hopefully that's how they become public policies. That that's an outdated model, and that what a think tank should really be is focused locally. Right, that there are, we believe there are innovators all over the country, people who are doing things to lift up their communities. Um, that are people who are transforming their communities in all kinds of interesting, innovative ways, but those. Innovations don't get scaled, they don't get circulated, they, they're not visible to anybody else, they're not visible into the policymaking process. And so one of the things I do at New America is to create a national network for those kinds of innovators. And I have to tell you, it's pretty wonderful to be focused locally on great things happening. Um, and, they're, and they are happening. So that's part of, part of uh, what I do. And then the tech piece of what I do 
is a little hard to explain because we're inventing it. It's, um, we're trying to, one way to talk about it is to say that we're trying to invent a field of public interest technology the way there's a field of public interest law. Like it used to be, you went to law school, you could work at a firm, you could work you know, in government, you could work at a corporation, and then we made a deliberate decision as a society to create the infrastructure for people to, to uh, do public interest law, to work at civil rights organizations and other kinds of institutions. We're trying to do the same thing for technologists, and the idea for that comes from the fact that we recruited, after the healthcare website mm -hmm. failed, we discovered that government, we didn't actually, it wasn't a tech problem, it was a management problem. Um, we don't manage big, Things that Silicon Valley companies do all the time, government doesn't manage particularly well. So we recruited literally hundreds of hotshots from the Silicon Valley to do two-year tours of duty in government. Um, and I, because of where I sat at the Domestic Policy Council, I got to um, put send those tech teams on assignments to do big things at the, at the federal agencies. And I had to help convince people at the federal agencies like people processing refugees wanted to know, why do you need me to sit down with these like engineers and product developers? Like, why they don't know what I do. Um, but when it clicked, it was amazingly transformative. And the NGO world, which is the world that I come from, needs that capacity. Mm -hmm. Like the technology cha is changing everything about the way we live and work. The groups like the ones I worked with at NCLR that are running early education centers or trying to provide low-income housing or doing whatever it is that they're doing are trying to solve 21st century problems with 20th century tools and they need the same tech capacity mm -hmm. um, that we're also recruiting for government and that is fueling some of the biggest innovations changing our lives. And I learned that there are technologists who find, and this is a quote from a technologist, I didn't make this up, who find meaning doing that kind of work and you know, came and started doing it in government and to quote one of them, he said, I didn't want to go back to what I was doing because I was going to be using my skills to invent the next way people are going to send each other pictures of their cats. Mm. And here mm -hmm. he, you know, he was not so, not so bad, but here he was transforming the way veterans receive benefits from their country. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm sure, you know, what's happened in the election, um, you know, until our country has made, you know, tremendous has brought tremendous demand and, and tremendous interest for doing well and doing good. Yeah. And, well, a lot of people in this room do well and do, will do well and do good. Um, but yeah, I was just hearing at Emily's list, you know, there's a tremendous number of 8,000 women wanting to run versus 600 typically. So, I mean, there's a lot of demand in there. I think there are 8,000 indivisible chapters. I mean, this is all related. One in every, at least one in every congressional yeah. district in the country. Yeah. So I think maybe we took our democratic institutions for granted. I think I did, and I worked in one. Mm -hmm. In, in one of the branches of government. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are things I thought were unshakable, mm -hmm. and it turns out they're not, mm -hmm. right? So uh, that's, boy, is that up to us. That's the whole point of a mm -hmm. democracy. Yeah. We, and it turns out we don't get to take that stuff mm -hmm. for granted. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, that's, that's fantastically inspiring. And uh, Thank you. so now we have all of your questions, and I see one in the front row. Yes. Oh yeah, microphone. Okay, do you want me to pass it around? Does it pass around or not? Yeah. Okay, does it travel, that microphone or not? Does it travel? I have a beautiful... Oh, oh, I see they're going to line up. Okay, cool, yeah. Okay, great. Line what up. am I doing? Go, go for it. Oh, okay. So I had to write my question down, and for anybody that knows me, uh, that's not normal because I don't become speechless very often. Um, but uh, I was born and raised in Colombia. Mm -hmm. I am what would have been a dreamer if it was around. Um, I'm a political refugee. I'm a Latina. I'm a woman. Um, I can keep going. Uh, but so before I even ask you my question, I just mm -hmm. have to tell you, you're a true inspiration. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I hope to one day be able to accomplish what you have accomplished in your life. Um, and so I wrote down I, I, that I, too, have been very hesitant to even consider government involvement, especially in the current times. Um, and so what advice could you give to someone like me uh, that lives in the external world, primarily in the international and, and government consultant sector, uh, but that I'm quite frankly scared to think um, at this point that if we don't get involved, our people will become extinct? Um, I would love to hear what suggestions you may have 
Um, and before I finish, I wanted to tell you, I, I work for the Annie E. Casey Foundation oh, yeah. and partner in Rhode Island with New America. Uh, and your team is currently working in the Rhode Island Department of Children, Foster Youth, and Care. Family Services. And Marina Martin and her yes. team are partnering with us as consultants. And I just have to tell you, it's a team of innovative technology folks that really have no background in child welfare or foster care. But I was meeting with them last week and giving them an overview of child welfare and the amount of expertise and support that they'll be able to bring to the child welfare sector um, is going to be humongous. So thank you for, for that. Thank you. So that's a great example. Marina yes. Martin, who you just mentioned, is one of our tech fellows. She's the woman who transformed how VA delivers services when she was in government. And she came to us and said, now I want the foster care system. And if anybody can change it, can transform it, she's the one. So thank you for raising that and, and for what you said. Um, so I understand people's sense of discouragement about maybe about public service. Um, but I have to say that, look, I was a political appointee, so I only saw it from one direction. But I worked with career staff at the federal agencies who were amazing, amazing people. And, and, and many of them are sticking it out, right? And that's what they do because it's what the, what the country needs from them. Um, and uh, where's my colleague who's working with the Promise Zone? Are you way in the back? Did I see you there? Hi. Two colleagues who are working with the local Promise Zones. So, so that's a program that I had a lot to do with creating. Philadelphia has a Promise Zone. There are 20 of them around the country. Um, when I talk about innovation really driving the country forward, it's because of, of public service-minded people who have the courage to believe that they can make things better, neighborhood by neighborhood, street by street, city by city, or state by state, or for a whole country. Without that, we can't move forward. Um, and, uh, and we have it in abundance. That's the thing. Like, if you, you do it, you won't be alone. You'll be surrounded by some pretty inspiring, amazing people. And the ones I am most inspired by, and I, I, my former staff knows it's really easy to make me cry. The president used to... <laughs> used to tease me about that. The people I'm most inspired by are the people who will probably never speak at a forum like this. Their names will never be in the paper. And they, did the, they do these heroic things every single day that on behalf of people who will never know their names. That's a, it's an amazing privilege and a gift. And if, you, um, if you're willing to take it on, the, you know, the country needs you. And you know, the fact of you being a Latina and an immigrant, that's experience that we need, right? And voices that we need. And sometimes you're the only one in the room, and it, that matters a lot. Um, I had the privilege of working the whole eight years on Native American affairs. Mm. Um, I learned a ton uh, and worked well. also with amazing, amazing people. Um, and the colleagues that I work with who are Native American, um, we're always the only one in the room, mm -hmm. right? Jody. Jody Gillette, um, who is a really extraordinary person. Um, and dealing with talk about really epic problems with deep roots in history that feel really intractable. Um, uh, I'm incredibly inspired by what they did. So there are other people who are also the only ones. Uh, and that's who we need. Like, we, we need everybody. We need every, and this is, I, I learned this in the administration, we need every pair of hands, every heart. Um, and the, the, the more different kinds of people with different kinds of experience are in the room, the better the decisions will be. Thank you. Great. Yes, sir. Hi. I hate to do this. Go for it. Okay, with your permission. I started a Meet the Candidate series in a neighborhood in North Philadelphia a couple of years ago that was not used to seeing candidates come in and mm -hmm. ask for votes. And uh, it was one of those neighborhoods that uh, Richard Nixon talked about when he started his war on drugs. Mm -hmm. You know, and I tell folks you need three things to run a war on drugs. You need drugs, you need guns, because what's a war without guns? And you need a battlefield. Mm -hmm. So we know where the drugs and the guns came from, and we know who gave up the battlefields. And uh, so they were not used to being paid attention to. Mm -hmm. 
and we were in the middle of a congressional race. Uh, Chaka Fatah was our mm -hmm. congressman. Unfortunately, Chaka had a hard fall. And, uh, and, and I, don't, I don't say that facetiously. We, you know, we like Chaka, and it's, it's tragic mm -hmm. to see someone go down that road, especially mm -hmm. where he came from. Mm -hmm. I mean, his, the, what he accomplished was phenomenal, mm -hmm. given how his life started. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, that's a hard thing to watch. Um, but I, everyone but Chaka showed up that was running for, for the seat. Mm -hmm. And we had one fellow who came in, very nice guy, uh, from the northwest section of the city, a Democratic committee man, an attorney by training, accomplished, mm -hmm. helps a lot of people, has done a lot of good things. And he's also an advocate for gun control. Mm -hmm. Sat on Pennsylvania ceasefire, that sort of thing. And I said to him while we were standing on a street that three hours after I stood in this spot with him, a 16-year-old boy would be face down with a bullet in his back mm -hmm. and die later that day when they took him off the respirator over Temple Hospital. And I said to him, Dan, uh, I said, it's not gun control, mm -hmm. it's jobs. And, and when you look at the history of this neighborhood, when the jobs were here, the guns weren't. Mm -hmm. So you're focusing on the wrong thing. So this brings me to mm -hmm. my question and my point. It seems to me, and policy is necessary. Policy is a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. And we have really great minds doing very good work that needs to be done, okay? But it seems to me that policy winds up doing everything but addressing the actual core problem. We have a problem, and then we start doing all these other things and forget about what started it, mm -hmm. and it never gets addressed. So, there so go. Give, give us a question. We so, need a question. So is, is that accurate? Am I getting an accurate read on that? Um, it's a good question. I would say not quite. Um, you're right that you, you're not, you can't solve individual problems in isolation, right? Because they are all interconnected. This is part of the reason that we developed place-based policy making, right? The, the area in Philadelphia that's a promise zone, the goal is to be working on multiple things at once, right? You have to be working on people's economic status and people's um, educational status and their preparation for jobs and making jobs available as well as the safety of the neighborhoods and people's access to health care and a whole range of other things. You can't, the, the, the idea of a place-based policy is based on the notion that you can't just invest in education and expect that everything else is going to be fine. You have to find ways to do all of it all at once. The reason that we went from an epic economic downturn, the, the worst one since the Great Depression, to a record-breaking spell of job creation um, is policy. And the President, President Obama used to like to say, we have to walk and chew gum at the same time. We have to be working on jobs at the same time that we're working on violence and at the same time that we're working on health care and other things. Um, and this experiment in, in investing in places and not just policy. So we help, so if, when you look at poverty, for example, we do multiple things. There are programs that are about putting resources right in people's pockets. So, so that's one set of policies. There's policies that are aimed at systems like the educational system or the housing system. That's a second set of policies which affects those folks. We decided also to invest in their neighborhoods and in ways to kind of knit together all of these different things to make sure that you're moving the needle for people on a variety of indicators. Uh, policy is a really important tool for all of those things. It's not the only tool. Um, uh, but it, I've seen it be incredibly powerful. And uh, you know, we didn't end up with a record-breaking um, uh, track record with respect to creating jobs um, for nothing. Yeah, no, fantastic. OK, um, how about back here? Wait, Deirdre's at the oh, microphone. Sorry. Oh, excuse me. Deirdre, go for it. Hi, I forgot we have a mic up here. So we did a policy question, now we can talk about a career question. Okay. Uh, you got everybody fired up. They all want to go to Washington. And so how do you do that? And I think 
it, could you talk a little bit about sort of the, honestly, I hate to say it, but you know, sort of using networking and getting to know people. I mean, I talk to people all the time about who they should go talk to in Washington. And Miguel Rodriguez, who is your colleague and who teaches for fun in Washington, I don't know how he has enough time in his day for all the informational interviews that he does. Um, and we all do it. And so could you talk about, you know, sort of how to get over sort of that, you know, yeah. oh no, I can't possibly ask, you know, sort of for time from this person, but it's important and you have to do it. Yeah, it is important and you have to do it. Um, it's funny, I have a, a daughter who is a recent college grad who is in this process. She's, she's not, not interested in policy, she works in other things, but it's requiring the same kind of approach. And it's the thing about Washington and policy jobs is that um, people come from lots of different kinds of backgrounds, but you, the people who end up in Washington are civically minded people. That's true of people on both sides of the aisle. They're people who who are interested in making a difference in, in the way that they believe is best. Um, and not all, but most had somebody uh, that was influential in their lives that helped steer them in a direction that helped open the first door. And so people in town are actually very, very good about, mm -hmm. um, about helping others along the same road. Um, but it is important to ask, and it's important to reach out, and it's important to, to have good questions when you do it. Um, but uh, the, the hardest thing to get in Washington is your first job, right? Is to, is to get the door open a crack so that you can get started. And once you get started, you get to know lots of people who open other doors, mm -hmm. but you have to mm -hmm ask around and talk to people in order to get that first job. It requires mm -hmm. work, it sometimes takes time, but, mm -hmm. um, but people are much more open and available to it than, mm -hmm. you, than you might think. Mm -hmm. Well, and you all grew up with the internet. Like, you're not quite as old as I am, but we used to do card catalogs, okay? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you've got the internet, you can travel around, and there's internships, oh my God, internships are amazing. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> and, but ask for time, I mean, ask for time. Yeah. No, and use Penn. I mean, there's great resources here. All of us will connect you to anyone we, anyone we know and can. Now we've got you on our team. Okay, great. Whoops, did I have a... Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Okay, if, if you all want to stay Wait, where you are to ask a question, that's fine. Just as long as you shout so we can hear you. So we can all hear you. He let us down. Yeah. Go use the mic. Okay, yeah, use the mic if you want. Sure. <laughs> I have one question. Um, so one thing I've learned being Asian American in America, being Indian American, is there's a, from Ohio, grew up pretty safe and lucky in that I didn't face a lot of racial discrimination. Learned a lot about that when moving to Philly five years ago. And we take for granted Asian Americans, Indian Americans. I can speak about my experience, my family's experience, that immigration, law, and all these dreamer issues aren't necessarily our issues. That's something that I face a lot when I talk about immigration issues with my parents and with people in my community. Mm -hmm. How, if at all, have you talked to communities that don't think it's their issue mm -hmm. um, about immigration issues yeah. and how it's probably a waterfall of, you know, if dreamers get pushed back, it's going to be <laughs> us next. It's going to yeah. be Muslim Americans. It's going to be, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the vast majority of immigrants who come, I mean, the the, the Debate about immigration tends to focus on undocumented immigrants. The vast majority of immigrants who come, come legally. Uh, there's only two, well, three ways to do that. You'd be a refugee or an asylee because you're fleeing something and you have to demonstrate that. Um, you can come because an employer sponsors you for a fairly highly specialized position. Or you can come because a close family member sponsors you. That's it. There's no line to get into other than those lines. That's why there's so many undocumented people because there's no line for them to get into, right? You can't be someone in wherever and, and decide you're gonna be an immigrant to the United States and get in a line somewhere. There is no line unless you meet those criteria. Um, if you look at what the Trump administration proposed as a price for the DREAM Act, it includes cutting legal immigration in half, which is completely nuts. So, so, so who are those people? Like, who are the people who would not come who are coming now? 
The only people who can come on a family visa, and the majority of legal immigrant visas are family visas, I as a US citizen can petition for my spouse, my kids, my parents, my siblings, period. Period, that's it, those are the only categories. So if you cut legal immigration in half, it's half as many of those people, right? You could eliminate the siblings category, which some people want to do, and that still wouldn't get you cutting it in half. So you have to eliminate or create much longer lines for my spouse, my kids, or my parents. That's who we're talking about. These are not random foreign people with no connection to the United States. These are the family members of Americans that we're talking about. So that's why it's, it's, it's our issue. Um, my husband is a, uh, he's from also South Asian, he's from India. He came in on a sibling visa through his sister who married a US citizen. Uh, the system is slow, it's backlogged. You can wait 20 to 25 years for one of those visas if you're a sibling of a, of a US citizen. Uh, there are definitely ways to fix it, but here's what's really, really interesting. The economic evidence all shows we need way more immigrants. Like the best way to the, and the shortest route to economic growth is actually expand, expanding who we admit and how many we admit. It's like really clear. There's very little disagreement about this among economists and people who look at the data and think about this. It's abundantly clear. And of course, we're having a very different debate. And right now, it's being driven by the, ex frankly, people who are extremists, who it, I can't believe they're in the White House, but they are, um, who you know believe that it's kind of a zero sum. If one person comes, that's one less job for an American, and actually, the people who come have the effect of creating jobs for everybody and stimulating the economy. And the countries that are worst off and, or, or, or that are struggling economically, the developed countries that are struggling economically in other parts of the world, are countries that have low immigration. Um, so we're, it turns out we're shooting ourselves in the foot by with the kinds of, with the kinds of by not reforming our system and by with the kinds of policy debates that we have. And um, Look, undocumented immigrants and the way that debate plays out are a proxy for something bigger. It's not just about people who came, who didn't have access to an ability to come under the law. Some of this is a reaction to the fact that we're just changing as a country, right? Where our demographics are shifting. And it turns out that's not a new phenomenon. The United States has been changing as a country forever, right? That's, our, that's who we are. And Ben Franklin, you know, from yes, this town, amen. really, really worried about the Germans. And he was very worried that English was going to lose its primacy because there are so many Germans, right? Mm -hmm. Turns out these are old worries. And the people who worried those worries have always been wrong. And we've always gotten past it. And we are in such a moment now. And, you know, our capacity to get past it is in question. But that's up to us. And the, but like one of the most powerful um, advocacy tools we have is the people who stand up and tell their stories. And there's no better example of that than the dreamers, who kind of made it inevitable. Um, like the day will come when that's all behind us. But that's because people were brave enough to stand up and organize. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Great answer. Great answer. Yes. Yes. The front here. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, DAPA yeah. and what happened mm -hmm. there um, and sort of the struggles that you went through to create it in the first place and then what happened when it was challenged. And yeah. So we've talked about DACA. DAPA is the bigger executive action that President Obama announced in November of 2014. Um, what is that acronym? So DAPA is Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, right? So the idea is we had established the use of enforcement authority to protect DREAMers. Um, we proposed, essentially attempted to expand it to undocumented immigrants who had a U.S. citizen child. The theory, the legal theory behind that is Congress has already spoken to the question of whether a parent of a U.S. citizen will be an immigrant. The answer to that is yes. There is a visa available. When a U.S. citizen turns 21, they can petition for their parents. So since the reasoning is, since Congress has spoken to this issue, 
These are people who are probably not going anywhere. They're going to be immigrants. We might as well give them the capacity to work. Let's defer their deportations as long as they are law abiding. And there are, you know, of about five million mm -hmm. such people. Um, and so that's the thing that we attempted to do. We got sued. And the people who sued us were smart enough to do it in a district court in Texas with a judge who is willing to color outside the lines, in my view. Um, and we lost. And this judge um, dismantled DACA from uh, the Texas courtroom. We went up to the Fifth Circuit. We ultimately went to the Supreme Court. At that moment, when we lost that case, um, DACA was exposed. Mm. Right, because it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the thing which gave the nine attorneys general who wrote to President Trump saying, you must dismantle Do DACA or we're going to sue. The reason that was a credible threat is because all they had to do was add it to, this, to, this, to the DAPA lawsuit in Judge Hanen's court. And we all kind of know what the outcome is likely to be. Um, so we, the, the, the reason that the president took this executive action um, had to do with two things. One, he, he was really reluctant to take executive actions in this space. And the reason for that is that they're not permanent. You're asking people to sign up for their own deportations. And he knew at the time, nobody predicted we would be where we are now, but he knew at the time that you can't guarantee that future administrations will preserve the policy. They have the absolute right to revoke it. It was unthinkable, but not impossible. Mm -hmm. And at what President Obama said on the day we announced DACA was, these are young people who deserve better than to plan their lives out in two-year increments, right? But all he had the, felt he had the executive authority to do, which was already an aggressive use of executive authority, was to do this temporary thing. Um, and, and so he came to it very reluctantly. He only asked us to prepare the executive action, which became DAPA, the larger one, after it was clear that the bill that we passed in the Senate in 2013 was not going to go through the House. Speaker Boehner called him and said, mm -hmm. I know I told you I was going to do it, but I'm telling you now I'm not. And that was when the president said, OK, then mm -hmm. I'm going to have to do what I can. Um, uh, those are those are hard choices in part because we knew we would get sued. Now we thought and continue to think that we were on solid legal ground, mm -hmm. but um, you can't assume that judges will agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's that wasn't mm -hmm. that wasn't a good day, <laughs> the day of that decision. Um, do, do you regret any part of that? I mean, would you looking back? Do you think you or he would say, no, we did X wrong or Y wrong or we should have done Z? You know. You know, this is going to sound strange, but I believe this to be true. I think it's too early to say. Uh, because, and some of the answer to that is going to depend on what happens now with DACA, right? Um, I will say that one of the president's great frustrations, and he had a lot of tough meetings with advocates who were my friends, um, uh, was that people in the advocacy community got so tired, understandably, of dealing with this fairly useless Congress of the United States, that um, that they put a lot of pressure on the president to act, and they took their his view was that they took their foot off the gas with Congress, and we had a bipartisan bill that had passed the Senate with 68 votes, uh, and the advocates were not as focused on the House as he would have liked them to be. He he really mm. urged and entreated them mm. to stay focused on the House as they were pushing him on executive actions. Um, and it may be that even had they done everything he asked them to do, that it wouldn't have happened. But we'll never know that. Mm. And I, it's hard to say this out loud, but it's possible that the, you know, the way the story ends is that there's no DAPA or DACA. I, I hope that's not true. You know, there are lots of people working to make sure that it's not true. but. I don't know. Mm. Um, I do know that we have to pass a law eventually, and that we are now years away from that. And this, we really, we've been trying to get this done for 20 years. Mm -hmm. hmm. Okay, we have to have a happier question now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Who has a happy question may come. Yes, is that a happy one?
Hi, so I have a question about um, your new role at New America mm -hmm. um, and spe specifically in terms of policy and technology. Mm -hmm. um, so I work as a corporate private investigator and in my field we're always using new technolo technological tools um, to try and improve strategy and efficiencies. What do you see um, are some of the new trends in technology as being most impactful in making long-lasting and public interest-based policy changes? Yeah. So it's interesting, what I'm learning, I mean, we're trying to invent this field, right? What I'm learning is that um, when you talk to an NGO about tech, they think IT, they think systems, they think the accounting system and, and right, making my computers run, making my printer run, and which is not what we mean by this. We're, and we don't have a vocabulary for this yet, so it makes it kind of hard to talk about. What we're trying to do is bring tech thinking to the process of problem solving. So it's not just about the technological tools. I mean, the, the world is full of people who see, pro and the Silicon Valley is really full of people who are seeing problems, who believe they have the solutions to every problem, and maybe they do. And so they build, they'll build like a killer app for something and then send it or take it around and hope that people will use it. And that tends not to work very well. What does work well is when you have a team of people who are trying to solve a problem, and they include people, to use an immigration example, people who know immigrants and refugees, and people who, who do tech. And the, it turns out, what, what I have witnessed is that when you have a table like that with, of people who are trying to solve a problem together, you've, you've expanded the skill set that is available to solving that problem. And it may be that what you build is, is you're engineering a, it may not be a technological solution, it may be engineering a way of working which is different. Um, and it's that tech thinking capacity that we lack. Now sometimes that's gonna lead to a tech solution, but sometimes it won't. What Marina Martin's trying to do with the foster care system is right now, in lots of places, you place children with families using file cards in alphabetical order. Now clearly, there's got to be a different way to do that, right? Um, so uh, so I, I can't be specific enough about sort of technological trends. It's more about addressing problem solving with a new set of tools. Cool answer. Cool question. Happy question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Until you have a cell phone. I tried very hard not to not to have this job. I mean, I really. <laughs> and and actually, there is an argument that. So this is actually. I mean, it happens to be true. But I also think. Part of what he was looking for, which is, uh, he's a pretty unique man. Part of what he was looking for were people who were not, not, Washington is full of people who will have their eye on sort of their next thing and how they're, gonna, how they're gonna grow in influence and power. And you can spot those people a mile away. He was not looking for those people. There were some people like that in the first term. They were mostly gone by the second term. <laughs> Um, Wait, I was gone by the second term. And some of them are supremely talented, important, like tremendous people. Mm -hmm. um, he tends to gravitate more to the people who, who are really interested in the work and not so interested in themselves. Now, I will say mm -hmm. that I, I have those characteristics, but not, not being interested in myself can also be harmful. I'm not a person who sucks up a lot of oxygen in the room, and that makes me less effective as an advocate, right? So it's not all not always a great quality. I have to work hard in a room full of really smart, you know, really committed people, and I was in rooms like that every day for eight years. There's a part of me that thinks, oh, like, what do I have to contribute? Like, this can't be a club I'm in. Uh, so I have to work pretty hard to assert myself. And I do that by making sure I really know my stuff, right? But you also said you follow what you love. I, that's also, that's right. And, and, and that got his attention. Well, the, and the qualities of the people who were ultimately most successful and the people who stayed eight years and who, the people who I believe and hope will have lasting relationships with each other and with the, with the president, 
um, are really, really love what we do, are really committed to something that's not about ourselves and our careers. You know, most of us have not gone on to do things that are going to make us famous um, and don't really care. Right? Th so those are the, the, the qualities he ended up looking for is somebody who's in love with what they're doing and more interested in what they can accomplish, more ambitious about what they can accomplish for others than for themselves. But the, the, your point, Elizabeth, the do stuff that you love that makes you want to get up in the morning, th that's where you will shine, right? If it's something that you are passionate about, you will shine. I say this as someone who hires people all the time. You can tell when somebody is sitting in front of you that wants this job because it's the next thing they think they need on their resume. And the difference between that person and the person who's like, oh my God, this is what I've always wanted to do and because it's who I am, those people shine in very different ways. And he's good at spotting the latter. Mm. Lovely. Be one of those people. Okay. <laughs> That's a great answer. Okay, great. Yes, go ahead. So there's some, a lot of big ones. I mean, I'm very proud of DACA. Um, I'm really proud of the Affordable Care Act. Really, really, really proud of the Affordable Care Act. CFPB. Creation of the CFPB, for sure. Um, here's another one that they can't dismantle. <laughs> um, we convinced almost every state in the union to set high educational standards for their kids. Uh, that's done. It happened. It happened at state by state. Um, and it's not coming unraveled. Um, we did that with a policy called Race to the Top early in the first administration, in the first term. Um, and by creating a pool of money that states competed for, we required the states to set high standards. They, get, they got to decide what the curriculum is. This, this is for folks who follow the education debate. We did not say anybody had to use the Common Core curriculum. Common Core is one example of something that meets the standards. But by designing that policy that way, it's like 47 states that, that upped their standards, that, that created college and career ready standards for kids. That's a big deal and I'm very proud of it and it is one of many things that, there's lots of things which go unnoticed. We passed, I mean the things I tend to be proudest of are not necessarily the biggest things. Um, they, I, I kind of like being proud of the things that didn't get noticed. We passed a tobacco law that was we'd been trying to pass for 12 years that will save lives. We, um, I think I'm perhaps proudest of some of the stuff that we, we passed that affects Native Americans. Mm -hmm. uh, a Native American woman has a one in three chance of being raped in her lifetime. Uh, and that is in part because it used to be... <laughs> that men could travel to a reservation and attack a woman, and then as soon as they left the reservation, the tribal police didn't have any jurisdiction. Uh, we changed that with the help of Congress. Um, and if you want an uplifting moment, look up the video, which is still online, of the woman who introduced the president at that bill signing ceremony. It's called the Tribal Law and Order Act. Mm -hmm. If you Google it, you will find her introduction of the president. Um, at the signing ceremony, and that is one of, I have these kind of snapshots in my mind mm -hmm. of moments that I treasure, and that is one of them. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of things like that that aren't coming undone. Mm -hmm. Now there's a lot that is, right? And, and, but understand that this is a moment in time and we don't know what the last eight years ultimately will add up to or what this period is ultimately gonna add up to until we get somewhere else. Um, and that's really important. What we do now to get somewhere else that somewhere else could be a much better place than we would have gotten to had the election gone differently. That's our job right now. Yeah, and vote in 18. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm going to use Oh, I, we should probably have, Lauren, how many more? One or two? One more. Oh, tragic. Okay, last question. Hi, I'm Jordan. Thank Hi, you Jordan. for coming. 
So my question is sort of that, about when we get to that somewhere else. So you talked about how much you got, you benefited from the transition that the Bush administration helped you do. Yeah. And it seems a little unlikely that this administration <laughs> will be willing to do that for the one that follows. Mm -hmm. So is that something that you thought about when you were leaving the White House? Is that something that you as former former officials think about now and if you'd be willing to help in that and what your role would be? Yeah, I think so. We would all be available, obviously, to an, an incoming administration to provide guidance and support. We learned, you learn a lot in eight years that you want to pass on. I also, even in thinking about what, I obviously hope the election would go a different way. I also thought it, it, that it was important to step back and let other people take the helm, that you, you learn a lot in eight years and it's important to pass out on that knowledge, but you, your ideas also may be getting stale and it's important to let new energy come in. I do think a lot about the, the institutions of our democracy, right? This, the, this sacred notion of the transition of power, which is worthy of being protected. There are lots of other things worthy of being protected. I ended up joining the board of an organization called the Project to Protect Democracy which was founded by some of our former colleagues from the White House Counsel's Office. And what they did this very interesting thing. They read a bunch of books about how autocracies start um, and kind of identified what the signs are. And then they looked at where are there institutions that are protecting us around those things. So there are institutions which focus on freedom of the press, for example, which is you know, curtailing freedom of the press is one of the signs. So which signs had people who were watching and which ones didn't. And then they organized an organization around, around the things which are important signals but didn't have institutions who were fighting for them. Things like attacking the civil service. Civil service is like really, really important. Things like the executive attacking individuals. Um, things like the White House not interfering in law enforcement decisions, which is like a really sacred, important principle. You, should, we, you cannot politicize who gets prosecuted or who doesn't get prosecuted. Those should be just law enforcement decisions and we stayed away from them. Those are norms, they're not laws necessarily, but they are really worth protecting. Not to mention like all of the ethics stuff, which is really important and it, which seems like the stuff that we had to abide by seems almost quaint in comparison to what's happening now. So I, I, it's, I, don't, I think it's really important that we not take stuff for granted. And I, I feel like I grew up with people in immigrant communities different from my own who said, we came because we experienced things that don't happen here. And I was naive enough to think that they would never happen here. And I'm clearly not, right? It turns out that's our job. So, you know, whatever it is that you're passionate about, it almost doesn't matter what it is as long as you engage, right? We, there are plenty of battles to fight. Your job is to pick which one is yours to do. And, the, the, and that gets back to your question. I thought about that when I was trying to figure out my next job too. You know, I hadn't looked for a job really in like 25 years. I had no idea how to do it. <laughs> I, I Terrible resume too. spent a lot of time, <laughs> but I spent a lot of time figuring, trying to figure out um, what, I had to listen to myself with respect to what do I think is mine to do right now. And I, I, that turned out to be a useful way to think about it, right? There, the Lord knows there's enough work to, enough tough stuff to go around. But what is it that you know about, care about, are passionate about, will be willing to throw yourself into and make the sacrifices that are necessary? Because that's, you will be good at that. You will make the most difference at that, whatever it is. Fantastic way to end. It was incredibly inspiring. Wow, you're amazing.